teams together and allows them to engage with projects with as little trust as possible. Um, and the, on the other side at Alan Gray, we have domain owners and line managers and architects and all of this pain. So, um, like light side and the dark side. So I'll pass it on to David. Cool. Okay. So um, our teams work on producing uh, internet applications for industrial plants um, that live on site with them and connect to various other processes. Um, and things that they need to talk to about, like whether a tank has exploded or not, and things like that of great importance. And um, they're usually deployed on Windows and are talking to a relational database and are a fairly standard like web application um, that's used for like managing the operations of the plant. So that's the product that they're working on generally. Our architecture is such that we like do some customization for all of our clients and then we've got a shared product. Um, the tools and processes that we use um, so we use Git for stuff, and then just to keep us from being too happy, we also have a back end that stores all of that in SVN. And um, it's a fun script I wrote, never mind. And, and then we've got a code review process that we use. So we use Gatorius for that, and that, that works quite well. We, I guess, have other processes around deployments and things. So like processes could cover like anything. But um, in terms of development, we're often working on like some small projects that will last a few weeks, and then other ones that last like three to six months or nine months. And those tend to be done using the traditional waterfall model. No, that's not entirely true. So we, we're in a position where we have to actually agree and sign on a contract with our customers, and we can't renegotiate things along the way. And in fact, if you try and do that, we find that causes more pain than um, happiness. So um, we tend to like have a fairly defined up spec up front for these things, but it's a functional like this is how the system, this is what the system will deliver, not like this is how the system is designed. So it's not really waterfall. And um, so then we design everything as we go along and change our minds halfway through. And um, so, and then the question about organizational structure. So we have um, three or four, te four teams or so. Um, one team who works on our underlying product framework -y thing. Um, two teams who are working on projects for different people, and then another team that um, sits in support and talks to all the people who discover our problems with caching. And um, we use, I guess, so we are fairly flexible also, like um, we don't have lots of layers of management, um, although you can ask my developers afterwards if this is really true. And um, we, yeah, that's basically how we work, I think. Does that answer the question? Yes. Good. Oh, um, can I just? Add on our, our tools. I didn't really touch on toolchain, uh, PyCharm, Mercurial, um, and we also have an MSDN license per dev so that we can do Microsoft Dev too um, and or stuff. And then at the, in the polyglot space of Alan Gray, there's a whole lot of things floating around. Um, but again, they're using Subversion moving to get there, um, so DVCS and that kind of thing. Yeah, so I have worked on a whole bunch of outsource coding projects over the years. Uh, currently, um, we're doing uh, outsource coding for process improvements in, for corporate space, um, which isn't too exciting, but it's a 10-year-old project, so it has all its interesting uh, problems of a code base that's that big and that, that old. Uh, in terms of processes, in the past, I've done a whole scr scrum adoption and uh, dealt with teams with that, and now I'm back in the architecture space. And what we're mostly doing is kind of XP-ish, Agile-ish. Uh, we're doing you know, stand-ups and have a board, and we do planning, and we sometimes do reviews. And uh, the biggest thing that we're doing a lot of is trying to put TDD and, and pairing into, into practice there for uh, our 10-year-old app, which is not necessarily architected with that in mind. Um, what was the last question? Organizational Thank you. <laughs> um, my organizational structures that I've worked in most of the time have been very flat. Currently, I report to the boss, and pretty much everyone does. So it's, it's a very flat system. Um, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I'm not going to restart. <laughs> I'll speak up next time. <laughs> okay. So um, what we do is develop open source software to improve lives of people living in poverty. That's specifically on the foundation. On the consulting side, we have a similar uh, mission statement. Um, it just has a slightly different focus on uh, target audience. Um, so in terms of tools we use, uh, for the people who were in, in Mike Jones's talk yesterday, you already touched on it. Um, all of our stuff is open source. A lot of our projects are available um, 
you know, on just open repositories. It's all BSD licensed. Um, and, well, we couldn't do our work without GitHub. We couldn't do our work without IRC. We uh, use Git flow a lot to manage our feature branches. So all of our crazy stuff happens in feature branches, goes into um, quite, a, quite a bit of review before it lands. And once it lands, it's considered stable for deploying. We generally refuse to deploy on Fridays because we like our weekends. Um, and so there are some things that are non-negotiable for us. On a code level, that's um, all work happens in a feature branch. And uh, all work needs to be reviewed by at least one, preferably two other team members. They need to give their plus one on the code before anything ships, just to make sure that everyone learns from the code that's written, to make sure that when someone else reads your code, they actually, it actually makes sense and, and someone else understands it. Um, so those are pretty much the tools we use. Um, no one of our devs um, runs Windows as their dev machine. Um, I, I don't think it's all that productive environment, and I have advised against people who joined us who wanted to w work on Windows and told them, no, it's, it's Linux or OS X. Um, so that's pretty much the tools. Um, in terms of other preferences, uh, dev environments, it's, it's all up to you as long as you get your work done. Um, as long as you use Git and um, you write tests and you issue pull requests for people to review. Um, organizational, organis that was the last one, hey? Yeah. Sorry. Um, organizational structure is, I, I like to, I don't know how to best describe this, but um, I think we're flat like a pancake with a whole bunch of unique strawberries. Um, <laughs> so we don't, we don't really, Especially in the dev team, we don't have much of a management type of role, but it is everyone is has their responsibilities and is expected to 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 take those on and, and deliver to you know just the full of their capacity. Um, yeah, so I think that explains it. If other people have questions on this, I'm happy to answer. Um, if anyone does, anyone have any questions at this point? Otherwise, I can I'm not any hands. Otherwise, I can move on with some yes. Maybe that's a, a good broader question is how do you deal with teams distributed across, uh, distributed and especially distributed across time zones? Okay, so for us, um, IRC is, uh, is, a, is a very important tool. Um, some people hate it because it's old. For us, it works really well just because the ecosystem and, and tools that exist around IRC are incredibly valuable. So. Systems report into our IRC channels on, on problems that are happening or new issues that are being created on GitHub or pull requests or th when, when new feature branches have been reviewed and are okayed and have landed. Um, so we have both people working in different time zones. Also, some people prefer to work very late at night, which pretty much comes down to the same thing. Um, so we have tools to that report back to us to say who's done what, um, what have they been working on, and again, IRC and GitHub um, provide a very important. Uh, well, those are pretty much the, the main pillars of uh, of how we work that allow us to to do this pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Um, also on time zones, um, Mr. Anastasiadis has a a great bunch of stuff on context and distance and things like that. Um, at the moment, we're busy working in, uh, and he's part of the local Cape Town community, that's why I mentioned him. Um, but we're working with a project in Atlanta, um, and the product owners are there. We're being a dev team for them from here, which means that sometime this afternoon, we'll be scheduling the planning for Monday um, to have the face-to-face. And we're going to be experimenting actually in this next week about doing video reviews at the end of each day so you can check out and actually have a face-to-face -face with someone when they get started the next morning. So that we, because of the most powerful method of communication being face-to-face, -face, if you can see someone's face at the end of the day, were they frustrated when they wrote that mail and that kind of thing, we lose that. So we're actually going to experiment, um, if we can, this week with, uh, with dropping in some videos. So trying to learn. Yeah, I, I worked uh, with the Dutch market for a whole bunch of time, uh, and that was actually valuable as well, just having that interaction face-to-face, -face, seeing, showing stuff and hearing the feedback as you show it and have a conversation. 
actually kind of critical for particularly remote product owners and actually understanding what the hell they're actually thinking and wanting. So yeah. Thanks, Lou. Um, we had a we haven't had a, our own development team being distributed across time zones, but for the first about eight years of the company, we didn't have an office and everybody worked from home. Um, and then what we've done is like probably now about a third of our people work in the office, but we have one day a week where we get together. I feel like video doesn't count properly as FaceTime because I never really want to have video chats with people on my computer. Um, so actually getting together with people <laughs> is important to us and partly because on the video chat, you're not going to really have a social chat usually. And actually, I think that social part of the environment is important to people understanding each other and working well together. Yeah, just a plus one to that. The actual really getting there is important for building context. So the product owner's been over and will be flying over back. You can't make up for that. Yeah. 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 And we do have clients all over the world in different time zones and partners who are working with us on projects there. So, so we have to do some of that like early late call stuff. Um, but it really helps to have as much real contact as you can. Yeah, I just have a, a follow-on question. Um, uh, are there some developers that you would be happy having work remotely and others that you wouldn't be happy with working remotely? And how would you decide between these two kinds? Somebody who in an interview says, how do you check whether people at home are working? Mm -hmm. That was a guy that I didn't employ. Um, <laughs> so um, I, th I think that w w there's a sort of level of somebody showing that they take responsibility and they're getting things done, which makes you feel comfortable about this. Um, and then there's just the thing about, is this going to work effectively as a team, like with the contact? Yeah, I, I think it's very tough because you can't, you don't really want to have double standards for, oh, this person can work at home and this person can't. So you kind of have to actually understand how, how people work and, and whether they're going to communicate heavily and, and actually give you the feedback. Because if they're kind of this little silo in the corner and they're just doing their stuff and getting done and or not getting done, then you don't know. Uh, then you have trouble because you can't see, you can't like prod, you can't actually get a feel for that. But uh, if you have good devs who are actually doing work and being productive, but how do you check test that in an interview? It's very hard to, to guess that. And I think there's a degree of responsibility here. So most people hit slumps from time to time, and usually if you're actually sitting with other people, that helps mm. you when you're in a slump. So if people can take that responsibility themselves to recognize that and self-manage, that's a big factor. Yeah. I think for us up, up front, I try to be very clear. Um, if people are interested in working with us, um, well, there is, the, there is the danger of someone becoming a hermit if, if mm -hmm. communication is very difficult. And I try to be very, very clear about that. Like, are, can, can you do this? Can you, can you work from home? Are you happy being alone and um, primarily you know, communicating over digital communication channels? And if someone struggles with that, then maybe it's not the right fit. So that's, that's one thing. The other thing is um, nothing speaks as much about someone who's about to join their co your team as, as the code they have actually already written and released and maybe contributed to an open source project. Um, so if they are familiar with open source work and they have contributed to these projects, um, they, they will be familiar with, with working at home and uh, most potentially, uh, well, working remotely, let's just put it that, and, and uh, most likely also alone. Um, so if, if, they, if they are happy with that and they thrive in that scenario and they understand it, then chances are it'll be a really good fit. Mm. Yeah, on that vein, um, yes. Can I just, oh sorry, uh, I'm interested. We internationally, a lot of companies, and uh, high profile ones, try and encourage employees to be at work. Mm. And because they find that, and then there's been quite a lot of articles written about this, that the most productive time is around the water cooler. That, that people work best when they see people social. And I kind of thought this discussion was going to be a bit about that kind of, you know, facilitators for working well. Oh. So I kind of like to know if do any of you do that, try and encourage people to be at work, like, you know, Facebook does. And do you pay attention to the composition of your teams? Because they've also shown that teams that are more diverse, with more different personalities in them, tend to work better than teams that are more homogenous. Maybe we can split this up into two questions. Um, one about uh, the kind of importance of FaceTime, and another one about um, kind of how you would structure your teams, both in terms of their skill set and, I guess, personalities and interests. Yeah, an important point. Of, an important point of view is one that we picked up in a tech talk that we watched a couple of Tuesdays ago, which was that uh, the GitHub culture of no management. And that's where I actually picked up this idea of doing videos for uh, asynchronous communication because they've got this nice mental model at GitHub that 
um, meat space is incredibly valuable and they really use that only for uh, celebration primarily and also sometimes for think shopping and workshopping. So if you want to force someone to be in meat space, when you, when you think of GitHub, they're properly distributed, time zones, world, people with different commitments and uh, who can't necessarily get there. So flying people into a place to have a meeting in a room is an incredibly expensive thing. So they value that a lot. The next thing that they value is synchronous communication. And then, um, so actually getting everyone onto a call at the same time is hard. And then asynchronous communication. That's where I'm starting to want to experiment with video. That said, um, the model that we started with about four years of team weeks is fun founded on this premise um, that a team is a valuable thing and a team works well together. So if you look, come visit our offices, you'll see we've got closing door team offices. So there's like a connected audio space for a team to work. There's pairing desks with two keyboards, two mouses, two screens, um, and each person has one of those so that anyone can slot in and pair if you need to because of the power of actually having a team. And product owners are encouraged to sit on site with the team. So um, that's an experiment. But by the same time, our part-timers are welcome, you know, work from home. We've got a team who works from their homes and pairs in on their Macs. But the full-time employee team experiment has worked wonderfully because of that power of face-to-face. -face. And coincidentally, most of their clients are in Cape Town because of the power of face-to-face. So we've linked, we used to be entirely really working from home, we're leaning a lot more towards putting people in the office now. Um, I play people city videos in most of our meetings because that's the most important thing that we do, right? Um, <laughs> so like that, that kind of like enjoying things together and stuff that just doesn't happen outside of that space in the same way and you can feel like it's happening but it's a virtual environment, it's not the same. So I agree that that's actually a very important thing. Yeah. Um, so for us, one of the things we've done is um, Every single Monday in Cape Town, we have a we have a team lunch, and it's it's really quite delicious. Um, <laughs> do you I mean, eat I, your I, team every Monday? <laughs> How do you hire the new one? <laughs> so I mean, I, I really like I like food, but uh, it's the same reason I like, I like food is because I like community, and it's it, it's really awkward if you have a meal with people and no one talks. Every, everyone thinks that's pretty awkward. So it's pretty hard not growing into a community of people who enjoy spending time together. Um, if, if you're eating together. So I, I really like good food and I like the process that it, that, 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 that brings along when you do share a meal with people together. Um, so that's, that's people in, in, in town obviously and we have a lot of people who, who work with us on projects who you know, stroll in on a Monday and just chat about random things. Um, and the, in terms of remote work is we, we try once a year to have a, a yearly retreat. Um, where everyone flies in from wherever they are and we, we spend a couple of days together completely away away from work where we just have FaceTime we talk about I don't know things we normally don't get to talk about um, might be work related might not be work related um, but it's it's mostly about FaceTime uh, get to know people that normally annoy you, annoy you over email for whatever reasons that turn out to be really awesome face to face um, and, and you definitely need those moments are we already on the yeah, diversity on the thing? Diversity question. OK. I had an answer, but it's gone now. <laughs> I might come back. Some people who have the answer, some people who don't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so picking up on the um, co-located, I would say always is better. I mean, co-located is always better. Uh, because you are picking up the storm piece when someone is irritated and pissed off, and then they send the email that you, know, you read, and you can read it in context, and you get context of what's happening. You can also hear people talking about stuff. What I like is a physical board. So when people finish work and they move stuff, you can see it. And someone goes and looks at the board and goes, ooh, what am I going to do next? You can actually generate a conversation from that. So you can actually pick up a lot of visual cues by being in the same space, which is actually really useful. Um, but I think also linked to diversity, uh, sometimes you can't find good devs. So diversity, I think, gives you great stuff. Uh, and if you can find a diverse team, that's awesome. Uh, but I think in Cape Town, if, I think everyone probably knows there's a very small pool of people that you can actually pull from who are actually really good, and that makes it harder. So you kind of look at options like how do I do remote, and how do I you know, have the less diverse team because I need to have developers to, to kind of develop. And I think that's where it gets tough. Hmm? Artists or uh, artists or artists? Yeah, so that, I don't, I don't yeah. <laughs> yeah. it, it's, I think it's tough. 
Um, but I'd love to see more diverse teams. It, it would make a positive impact, I think, definitely. Cool. Um, up to you. Yeah. Uh, to, to share some success stories from Alan Gray, um, they've just, you may have seen it, there's this ridiculously large building they've just built at the waterfront, which is amazing. Um, but what, what one of the results of that was is that they had two buildings before, and now they have one. And all the devs used to be split half in one building for retail and half for institutional, and now they're together. And you can now stand at one point and look, and within the span of your eye, see everyone who's working in the dev. And the change that that has made is remarkable. And there's one coffee area with two coffee machines, a coffee um, on tap, and there's the barista downstairs. But people, are, you know, those sort of synergistic, um, uh, one of these wonderful companies in the States has a good word for it, which has just fallen out of my head. But those sort of opportun opportunistic meeting other people at collecting spaces is happening really well. And um, all the, the uh, agile coaches meet in one corner of the space and can look out and see all the teams. And you can actually point at things and say what's happening. And when Scrum of Scrums happens, you can see people moving across the space. So if you have that, it's amazing to actually be able to get there. But that's a very expensive undertaking, both in the time commitment of the people who are coming there and in the commitment to building that space and keeping that space open. But in the same, they've, you know, you find teams with a diversity of skill, a diversity of background, um, and people who've come from the business world and decided they wanted to dev, and Alan Gray likes internally recruiting, so they'll actually skill someone up as a developer, which kind of sounds like, an ana sounds like anathema to people who grow up learning to read by copying code. Um, so it's, it's really interesting, and seeing good results coming out of those teams is quite encouraging. So my answer for diversity came back to me. Um, <clears throat> one, of, one of the things that I, I generally look for when, when people come to us is like outside of, outside of computer science, outside of time behind a computer, what, what are their interests? What do they do? Um, I, I find people who do volunteer work in communities super interesting. What motivates them? Why do they do this? Some of the best developers I, I've ever worked with, um, some of the, the people who've come up with like most brilliant solutions to stuff don't have a computer science degree but they're a psychology major or a social worker. And they just have to, to be really good with computers, but because of their understanding of complete other sides, other spectrums of, of society and, and very diverse skills, um, they came up with, with code solutions that no one else actually thought of because, well, if all you know is, is, is one thing, you're gonna be pretty pigeonholed in thinking in solutions within that, those constraints. Um, so some things that I would uh, look for, for example, in terms of diversity is like, well, already what I said, outside of, outside of time of their computer, what do they enjoy? I think within Prekelds, we've got enough people that play an instrument to start two bands. And I find that interesting. You know, that there's, there's, there's synergies between people playing in a band together as musicians and, and composing something and, and coming together to some final piece. And, and the similar, I see the same similarities between a team working really effici efficiently as a, um, you know, producing code and coming to something together. Um, so I'm, I'm not a huge fan of names like Agile and whatnot. I'm very much interested in the individual people who make up a team and how they come to, to, uh, to a solution. Um, so I don't know, I don't, that's, that's sort of how I approach it. I don't know if that answers your question. Um, I think we have a question from Lisa. Um, two things. <coughs> uh, FaceTime over lunch. Kind code reviews. Yeah, um, from our side, Sorry? also to, to borrow from other people's experience, but um, well, pairing works really well. And pairing doesn't have to be face-to-face. -face. You can do remote pairing. It actually works remarkably well, even if you just use VNC and share voice. You can see each other's screens. You can actually share the mouse and keyboard a bit better. Um, we're doing some experiments down here to see if our bandwidth really lets it work and I'm coding with someone on a volunteer project in the evening and that's working. Um, and so if anyone's keen on that, 
it, it's fun, it's easy, and it's easy to get started. Um, the other thing is, yes, get together, be nice, um, play foosball with them, um, let them know that you're approachable and that you occasionally can be beaten. Um, well, at least these two guys can occasionally be beaten. I, yeah, I'm regularly beaten. Um, but yeah, yeah, so being approachable. And the, the other thing is, it's kind of hard because at least for a guy like Dave and a guy like me who grew up as junior programmers in a big, wide, bad internet, figuring out how to do it ourselves, we're like, that's the way you learn, right? You know, there's no one holding your hand and helping you through it. Um, but we want more people in this space, and we want to be friendlier um, and nice people. So I think you kind of fast track people if you be nice in the code reviews, but also get to the why. And if people understand the why, then you, then you get a lot more out of it, as opposed to saying that's just wrong. So I think a lot of it's, it's kind of attitude, I suspect, with, with doing that remotely. Uh, I've also done remote pairing. I don't do it regularly, but we have uh, one remote worker. And uh, I found it very rewarding so, and very successful. Uh, but you know, I know other people who find it very frustrating and just too jerky uh, in terms of bandwidth and stuff like that. So. One other thing I forgot to mention was uh, we, don't, we don't really pair what we, uh, in terms of like, actual dev work. Uh, what we do pair on is, is deploys. So um, if we have a big deploy going out, we'll, we'll start what, we, what we've done it a bunch of times, a deploy train, which basically is a Google Hangout with a screen share. And whoever's interested just dials in and someone drives it. And then um, a deploy goes out. So everyone can actually see what someone else is typing and what they're talking about. And um, I quite enjoy it, because then I see things that I, I just didn't know before. Or other people can just tag along and see how this stuff works. Another thing is probably removing the bar of terror. Um, you know, There is a version control system. What you've got won't go into production if it sucks. And also, you don't have to be at that level as a junior. So Matt has been mentoring a, a, an intern of ours. And part of it was, how do, we, how, you know, how do we create this understanding that learning is OK? And it involves going all the way to the product owner and saying, this guy is learning. Um, it will be slower. And we need to be able to learn now. Um, so he's feeling, and he's got, he really wants to succeed. So he's got this high pressure to actually finish the work item. So he'll go and ask a senior dev to just give him the line of code. And creating a learning culture is also really important for junior devs. So I think I'm speaking to Lisa's question on that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we have a question from Morgan. Okay, so really easy for us um, because. How, okay, so the question was, how do you sell Python to your clients? Seeing as this is PyCon, um, the Py Python sells itself because Google did the work for us on App Engine. Um, it's hard to recommend anything else for a startup for us because platform as a service beats infrastructure as a service hands down. Um, on the technical side and on the business side, be saying our startup is powered by Google is just gold. So um, that, that's a bit of a no-brainer. Um, when, when people don't want to use App Engine, then, um, then we start say, just explaining that Python is good. And also, uh, the willingness to walk away is one of the important things of a good salesperson and someone who's creating companies. And my job is to make sure our projects are cool enough and weird enough. So, um, that said, the only two languages we, well, the two primary languages we work in are Python and C So, you know, boo and hiss now, but, um, the, the, but they suit two different types of clients. And of course, JavaScript, but I don't think anyone can not work in JavaScript these days. So, so you can all boo and hiss now, but uh, I'm a C -sharp developer. <laughs> So I, personally, I don't think language is that important, but I haven't had to force language, a different language into another. For instance, we have a 10-year-old app. I'm not going to sell rewriting in Python very easily because I can't sell a rewrite in C Sharp, let alone. But breaking off bits and going, where you, what can you do? Uh, I think it also depends on what your corporate culture is of what the, the client that you're putting into. For instance, it's very difficult for us to go to something like Mongo or something like that because the dude who manages the servers knows SQL he understands that you go give him another database type, it's like, no, um, I need to be able to make my own queries and stuff like that. So just I think there's this kind of ideological layer which is basically useless. So what we've mostly had <coughs> is kind of partners who are not sure about whether it's going to work effectively with us because our product's written in Java because it starts with a J, the name. So like 
it's like conversation is not like really about where this written, it's about trust. And once you establish trust with people and you're showing that you're delivering something, then it, they don't actually care as much anymore. So I suppose that was also a lot harder before all apps were delivered on the, most apps were delivered on the web because now as long as it works in browser, it doesn't really matter as much anymore. And that was our line in 05, we'll use Python for web apps where we don't have to convince people and C-sharp for the non-ones where they want to use Windows. And now we don't have to use C-sharp all that much. So, yeah. uh, question from JP. Oh, not me. Oh, that. What, me? Me. That's me. <laughs> How do we stop it from being. No, me. It's I'm, you. I'm not He's the St. James guy. Okay, I'm the other David who. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Uh, <laughs> so the, the, it's one of the hard things. but also in an adult scrummy kind of way, so I'm quite up the creek on that side of things. Um, at the last MyCon, someone said I won't say the word agile because then we might start scrumming, uh, which hopefully today will clear up some of the, the fudge around that because, uh, yeah, it's something that I find is, is quite useful. And question number three has just fallen out of my head. Organizational structure. Organizational structure. Internally, we're very flat. We're structured around how do we put teams together and allow them to engage with projects with as little crap as possible. Um, and the, on the other side at Alan Gray, we have domain owners and line managers and architects and all of this pain. So, um, like, like light side and the dark side. So I'll pass it on to David. Cool. Okay. So. Um, our teams work on producing uh, internet applications for industrial plants um, that live on site with them and connect to various other processes um, and things that they need to talk to you about, like whether a tank has exploded or not, and things like that of great importance. And um, they're usually deployed on Windows and are talking to a relational database and are a fairly standard like web application. Um, that's used for like managing the operations of the plant. So that's the product that they're working on generally. Our architecture is such that we like do some customization for all of our clients and then we've got a shared product. Um, the tools and processes that we use, um, so we use Git for stuff and then just to keep us from being too happy, we also have a back end that stores all of that in SVN. And um, it's a fun script I wrote, never mind. And, and then we've got a code review process that we use. We use Gatorius for that, and that, that works quite well. We, I guess, have other processes around deployments and things. So like processes could cover like anything. But um, in terms of development, we're often working on like some small projects that will last a few weeks, and then other ones that last like three to six months or nine months. And those tend to be done using the traditional waterfall model. No, that's not entirely true. So we, we're in a position where we have to actually agree and sign on a contract with our customers, and we can't renegotiate things along the way. And in fact, if you try and do that, we find that causes more pain than um, happiness. So um, we tend to like have a fairly defined up spec up front for these things. But it's a functional like this is how the system, this is what the system will deliver, not like this is how the system is designed. So it's not really waterfall. And um, so then we design everything as we go along and change our minds halfway through. And um, so and then the question about organizational structure. So we have. Um, three or four, te four teams or so. Um, one team who works on our underlying product framework -y thing, um, two teams who are working on projects for different people, and then another team that um, sits in support and talks to all the people who discover our problems with caching. And um, we use, I guess, so we're fairly flexible also, like um, we don't have lots of layers of management, um, although you can ask my developers afterwards if this is really true. And um, we'd, yeah, that's basically how we work. I think. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Good. Oh, um, can I just add on our, our tools? I didn't really touch on Toolchain, uh, PyCharm, Mercurial, um, and we also have 
an MSDN license per dev so that we can do Microsoft Dev 2 um, and or stuff. And then at the, in the polyglot space of Val and Gray, there's a whole lot of things floating around. Um, but again, they're using Subversion moving to get there. Um, so DVCS and that kind of thing. Yeah, so I have worked on a whole bunch of outsource coding projects over the years. Uh, currently, um, we're doing uh, outsource coding for process improvements and for corporate space, um, which isn't too exciting, but it's a 10-year-old project, so it has all its interesting uh, problems of a code base that's that big and that, that old. Uh, in terms of processes, in the past, I've done a whole scr scrum adoption and uh, dealt with teams with that, and now I'm back in the architecture space. And what we're mostly doing is kind of XP-ish, Agile-ish. Uh, we're doing you know, stand-ups and have a board and we do planning and we sometimes do reviews. And uh, the biggest thing that we're doing a lot of is trying to put TDD and, and pairing into, into practice there for uh, our 10-year-old app, which is not necessarily architected with that in mind. Um, what was the last question? Organizational Thank you. <laughs> um, my organizational structures that I've worked in most of the time have been very flat. Currently, I report to the boss, and pretty much everyone does. So it's, it's a very flat system. Um, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to restart. <laughs> I'll speak up next time. <laughs> OK, so um, what we do is develop open source software to improve lives of people living in poverty. That's specifically on the foundation. On the consulting side, we have a similar uh, mission statement. Um, it just has a slightly different focus on uh, target audience. Um, so in terms of tools we use, uh, for the people who were in, in Mike Jones's talk yesterday, you already touched on it. Um, all of our stuff is open source. A lot of our projects are available um, you know, on just open repositories. It's all BSD licensed. Um, and well, we couldn't do our work without GitHub. We couldn't do our work without IRC. We uh, use GitFlow a lot to manage our feature branches. So all of our crazy stuff happens in feature branches, goes into um, quite, a, quite a bit of review before it lands. And once it lands, it's considered stable for deploying. We generally refuse to deploy on Fridays because we like our weekends. Um, and so there are some things that are non-negotiable for us. On a code level, that's um, all work happens in a feature branch. And uh, all work needs to be reviewed by at least one, preferably two other team members. They need to give their plus one on the code before anything ships, just to make sure that everyone learns from the code that's written, to make sure that when someone else reads your code, they actually, it actually makes sense and, and someone else understands it. Um, so those are pretty much the tools we use. Um, no one of our devs um, runs Windows as their dev machine. Um, I, I don't think it's all that productive environment. And I have advised against people who joined us who wanted to w work on Windows and told them, no, it's, it's Linux or OS X. Um, so that's pretty much the tools. Um, in terms of other preferences, uh, dev environments, it's, it's all up to you as long as you get your work done. Um, as long as you use Git and um, you write tests and you issue pull requests for people to review. Um, organizational, organiz that was the last one, hey? Yeah. Huh? Sorry. Um, organizational structure is, I, I like to, I don't know how to best describe this, but um, I think we're flat like a pancake with a whole bunch of unique strawberries. Um, <laughs> so we don't, we don't really, Especially in the dev team, we don't have much of a management type of role, but it is everyone is, has their responsibilities and is expected to, to, to take those on and, and deliver to you know, just the full of their capacity. Um, yeah, so I think that explains it. If other people have questions on this, I'm happy to answer. Um, if anyone, does anyone have any questions at this point? Otherwise, I can, I'm not, any hands? Otherwise, I can move on with them. Yes. Maybe that's a, a good broader question is how do you deal with teams distributed across, uh, distributed and especially distributed across time zones? Okay, so for us, um, IRC is, 
is a, is a very important tool. Um, some people hate it because it's old. For us, it works really well just because the ecosystem and, and tools that exist around IRC are incredibly valuable. So systems report into our IRC channels on, on problems that are happening or new issues that are being created on GitHub or pull requests or th when, when new feature branches have been reviewed and are okayed and have landed. Um, so we have both people working in different time zones. Also, some people prefer to work very late at night, which pretty much comes down to the same thing. Um, so we have tools to, that report back to us to say who's done what, um, what have they been working on, and again, IRC and GitHub um, provide a very important, uh, well, those are pretty much the, the main pillars of, uh, of how we work that allow us to, to do this pretty much. Yeah, yeah. Um, also on time zones, um, Mr. Anastasiadis has a, a great bunch of stuff on context and distance and things like that. Um, at the moment, we're busy working in, uh, and he's part of the local Cape Town community, that's why I mentioned him. Um, but we're working with a project in Atlanta, um, and the product owners are there. We're being a dev team for them from here, which means that sometime this afternoon, we'll be scheduling the planning for Monday um, to have the face-to-face. And we're going to be experimenting actually in this next week about doing video reviews at the end of each day so you can check out and actually have a face-to-face -face with someone when they get started the next morning so that we, because of the most powerful method of communication being face-to-face, -face, if you can see someone's face at the end of the day, were they frustrated when they wrote that mail and that kind of thing, we lose that. So we're actually going to experiment, um, if we can, this week with, uh, with dropping in some videos. So trying to learn. Yeah, I, I worked uh, with the Dutch market for a whole bunch of time, uh, and that was actually invaluable as well, just having that interaction face-to-face, -face, seeing, showing stuff and hearing the feedback as you show it and have a conversation that you're kind of critical for particularly remote product owners and actually understand.